this is recorded. It is. You know, so yeah. you could, you know, uh, bribe me or, you know. I could bribe, bribe you. Bribe me. Um, uh, um, blackmail, blackmail, blackmail you. Blackmail. I could totally blackmail, blackmail you. you. But I wouldn't do that. Well. You're from New York. Come on, you'll have you'll have the mob chase after me or something like that. Well, when De Niro plays me, and I I sent you that thing about someone saying De Niro. You told me me about that. Oh yeah, you told me about that. So I'll send De Niro after you. Mm. Let me intro. What's going on, everybody? My name is Adele, sports neurologist at the UCLA Brain Sport Program. And today, as if guests could not get any better, with me, Dr. Jack Feldman. He is a distinguished professor of neurobiology at UCLA. And as I like to refer to him, the godfather of breathing. And Considering, you know, uh, since the Huberman podcast, people have been calling for uh, Al Pacino <laughs> to play you in, in the upcoming biopic on your life. I think it's, it's appropriate. No, well, my brother prefers De Niro. So, De Niro? Uh, yeah. So maybe that could be at two different stages in my life. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so primarily you're the godfather of breathing, or as I like to refer to you, because you discovered this pre singer complex in um, the human's brainstem. Is that right? Well, originally it was in rodent brainstem, in and rodent, then but, other people mm-hmm. found the equivalent in human brainstem. Right. And the function of the pre singer complex, it basically provides the rhythm for our breathing that I think sometimes we take for uh, granted sometimes. I think all the time. It's all the in, time. The, in the background. And uh, as a research uh, topic amongst my fellow neuroscientists, they tend to think this is an easy problem. It's it's rhythmic, and so how do you generate a sine wave? Or you know, it's very simple. It's like a pendulum. So people think that's simple compared to all these incredible functions we have, like memory and learning and vision and whatnot. Right. And it turns out when you look at what breathing does, it's pretty complicated. Sure. And the solution that nature has found to be able to meet all these different conditions is actually not at all what uh, most people expect it. And it's a lot more complicated. Right. And if your uh, listeners have a couple hours, I could probably explain to them. Yeah, I don't know if we have a couple hours. (laughs) We're probably going to have to come back for that. But um, I think let's lay a foundational understanding because what I want to cover, what I want to make sure that we cover is um, how breathing can change brain states and the potential neuromodulation of breathing. Right. So, can you lay out a, f- a foundational understanding to then build upon that um, regarding you know what happens when we breathe? Uh, well, you know, I I don't want to degenerate into a hour long lecture, so right. you know, right. please inter- interrupt yeah. if I um, go off in a, the wrong path. Yeah. The the basic mechanisms for breathing are in the brainstem. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the nervous system, we have the spinal cord, and right above that we have the brainstem, and then we have the highest structures, including cortex and cerebellum. The basic uh, st- neural structures for breathing, driving the rhythm are in the brainstem, and then the output of the nervous system is coming from either brainstem to like the tongue and to the muscles of the airways, or to the diaphragm and ribcage out, out of motor neurons in the spinal cord. Th- that is just taking care of the very basic homeostatic need for regulating oxygen and carbon dioxide. And through carbon dioxide, it's pH. It turns out over the past decade, people have realized that there are signals related to breathing throughout the brain. Mm-hmm. And I think originally it was just thought as being, well, it just happenstance and you know it doesn't really do anything. But other people found that when you interfered with these breathing rhythms, you had changes in emotional state, cognitive state, and the thought arose that maybe these breathing rhythms are playing a role in emotional and cognitive function. And if you go back thousands of years, people have been, manipula- been manipulating their breathing to affect the whole body, right. um, their emotional state, their cognitive state. So the phenomenology has been taken for granted by many people for a long time, but uh, we didn't really have a, a mechanistic basis by which this is happening. And we became very interested in trying to figure that out. 
and um, we we think we have some we have some good ideas about what's happening. Yeah. But but basically, th- throughout your whole brain, you have rhythms that are tied to the respiratory cycle. Uh, some of them may be coming in through the nasal system through the olfactory system because you breathe in, breathe out through the nose, that's going to sweep air across the nasal mucosa and you're going to detect smells mostly when you inhale, not when you exhale. So there's that rhythmicity and these olfactory signals are very widespread in the brain and we know they have profound effects. But we also have several other ways that these breathing signals can come into the brain. Um, One is from the central generators in the brainstem that not only project to the muscles ultimately, but also project upwards, because the brainstem's down here, upwards to the cortex, and through these projections can influence all sorts of behaviors. We have inputs from the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a very important nerve because it innervates almost all of our viscera, and it not only contains pathways that go to the viscera from the brain, but it contains pathways from sensors in the viscera, the lungs, the gut, and whatnot, back into the brain. And when you breathe, your lung expands and, and contracts, and that movement activates receptors in the lung, which sends signals back into the brain. And it's been known for some time that if you manipulate these the vagal signals, you can use it to treat depression, anxiety, just by appropriate stimulation of the vagus nerve. So breathing signals are coming in that way. Right. Uh, so it, let, let me interrupt you real quick because I think it's really important that concept that our our breathing and respiratory rate is oscillatory, right? And it and it um, originates in the pre botzinger complex in the brainstem. Correct. Right? And how does that exactly uh, uh, parallel or correlate with this oscillatory brain activity that is present throughout our brain? So there are many different rhythms that you have in your brain, ranging from frequencies as high as 100 per second down to a few per second. And then there's breathing, which in humans is about every five or six seconds. And so there are all these rhythms at different frequencies, but the breathing rhythm, which you find throughout the brain, is probably playing a role in helping the brain uh, cohere. And what I mean by that is that when I'm looking at you right now and listening to you, my visual system is seeing your face, my auditory system through these earphones is hearing you, yet I don't see this as two different things out in the world, right. even though they're entering my brain through markedly different places. I see you as a unified whole and not a voice coming out here and a face over there. And the big question that is, uh, neurobiologists have been th- thinking about is how the brain coheres this, or the, it's called the binding problem. Mm-hmm. And One of the ideas about how the brain binds is that there's a background of oscillatory activity. And if, for example, information comes in from my ear with from your voice and from my eyes about seeing your face, they will converge somewhere. And my brain or the neurons in my brain will see those signals. And if they're riding on like a peak of the oscillation, like let's say the peak of inspiration. Mm -hmm. My brain interprets that as being related to something, one thing. If they're out of phase, then my brain will say, well, they're two different things. And we experience this when you, you know, when you're fooling around with your video system and the sound gets a little bit delayed. It's very weird. Your brain has a hard time figuring out what's going on because the mouth is, you see someone on the TV screen with their mouth moving, but the sound may be delayed and your brain has a hard time dealing with that. So this coherence problem and binding problem is very important. And this is how I'm interpreting it is that our respiratory oscillatory sort of function is continuous in the background over which our oscillatory brain functions. That's how I'm thinking about it, how how I'm interpreting it right now. I don't know. Um, 
Well, for, first of all, it's not just breathing. There are lots of other uh, oscillations happening at different frequencies. Right. The unique thing about breathing is you have volitional control over it. Okay. The other higher fre other frequencies, you don't really have volitional control over it. That uh, they occur, right. and that's great. They occur, but because you can change your breathing rhythm, and if the breathing rhythm is playing a role in all these cognitive and emotional processes, mm -hmm. now if you shift the rhythm, that has profound consequences in the way the brain is treating its signals. And it may act in it, it, what, it, what seems to happen, which is, I guess, fortunate, is that if, for example, if you slow your breathing down, you can become less anxious. Mm -hmm. It can improve your cognitive function. Right. So why it acts in that direction is one of the things we're trying to figure out, but it's been known phenomenologically for a long time that if you want to relax, take a few deep breaths, or you meditate and you take deep breaths for 30 minutes, and you come out of it refreshed, and your cognitive function is improved, your emotional state usually is improved, um, and there's a real physiological basis for this. So, but... Are you implying that the 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 change in function it occurs on a on a global scale in terms of it being throughout your brain? I think more so what we're finding is there's relatively focal areas in the brain that this function that that change in your respiratory function might act on, right? Yes, I mean the brain has lots of oscillation, and there are different functions which are going on. So your emotions are there are certain structures which are important for emotion less so for higher in, uh, cog cognitive function. Right. And so these oscillations could be playing roles both in the each of those areas, but also in helping to bind those areas to give you some sense of unity in the world. Right. And then I think a big connection is the pre-bot the pre singer connection with the locus ceruleus, right? Uh, well, that's one we discovered, and that I have to give credit to my colleagues at Stanford who um, identified this. That's uh, Kevin Yackel and Mark Krasnow, who uh, identified a unique projection from the pre complex to locus ceruleus. Mm -hmm. And it seemed rather strange because the locus ceruleus is not involved in generating breathing movements. Right. The locus ceruleus is involved in all sorts of uh, functions related to alertness and being aware and focus. And why there should be a breathing rhythm there is not entirely clear. And then... Uh, and let me interrupt you. It's one of the primary sources of norepinephrine. Correct. In the brain, as well as because of that, it's one of the primary arms of the uh, sympathetic nervous system in terms of the autonomic nervous system. Well, it's important. The, the, the fact that it's nor, noradrenergic or norepinephrine at a locus ceruleus only incidentally ties it to the sympathetic nervous system because okay. the sympathetic nervous system uses as its output in the periphery norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. But essentially, the nervous system is very promiscuous mm -hmm. through evolution and it's taken all these different... Uh, chemicals and used it for its own purpose. Got it. So I would not tie the locus ceruleus uh, specifically to sympathetic activity. I would say it's affecting many aspects of uh, cognitive, emotional, and autonomic function. But I think nonetheless, it's uh, the study that you might be getting to might be one of like, you know, the main... Um, the, the main pieces of uh, uh, preclinical evidence that demonstrates that, you know, changing um, rhythm or uh, uh, respiratory pattern, right, can affect brain states. Exactly. And, and what Kevin did was a very clever experiment. He was able to ablate, which is a sort of polite term to kill, mm -hmm. the neurons in the pre Butzinger complex that projected to locus ceruleus. So in doing that, he's not interfering with other neurons in the pre complex generating the rhythm, but the ones that are projecting up. And what he found was when he did that, the animals continued to breathe just fine, but they gave all the appearance, these were awake uh, mice, of being much calmer. The respiratory rate didn't change? The respiratory rate slowed down. Okay. Okay, so it, it could have been secondary to slowing down the respiratory rate. But when uh, John Huguenard, who's an, another collaborator here, measured the uh, EEG, the brain waves, right, right. they were indicative of calming 
the brain that the brain itself was calming right. as a result of losing these neurons. Right. And so one of the ideas is that these signals are projecting through locus aureus, and locus aureus projects very widespread. Yeah. That is sending signals related to breathing that are sort of going to entrain large parts of the brain. And when you change your breathing rhythm, you're also going to change these rhythms in the brain. And as you change those rhythms in the brain, the way the neurons process information is going to change. Right. And I, I mean, you don't, you, in a way you notice it. You know, if you're, you're doing something that's high anxiety, uh, you're beginning, uh, you're going to sprint in a race. Uh, you're on the first tee and you're trying, getting ready to hit the first tee ball. Or you're about to take an exam. Or you, you're about to speak to a big audience. Or you're a little bit nervous and agitated. And we all know that one of the things that can relax you is one or two deep breaths. Mm -hmm. Why does that work? Yeah. And we think... That is because it's interrupting the circuits that are driving this anxiety, at least temporarily. Yeah. And that if you do that over extended periods, it seems to be helpful in treating more um, clinical aspects of having anxiety. So, you know, the anxiety you might have when you speak in front of an audience can uh, is emblematic of what a chronic anxiety would be, where just in any situation you're just anxious. Right, right. And then um, there's a projection to the amygdala, right? So the amygdala, uh, we're very familiar with the amygdala at the Brain Sport Program. And, you know, primarily I'm, I'm bringing my um, concussion and traumatic brain injury background into this conversation, Please right? Do. Which is really interesting. And, um, you know, in so in concussion patients, especially persistent post-concussion patients that they've had sort of these symptoms for a while, they a lot of them tend to develop this sort of fear avoidance pattern of behavior. And based off of that behavior, we're starting to, to think through fMRI, uh, Kevin Picard uh, at the program, uh, MD, uh, PhD, is doing like some great work with this. He's begun to see maybe some hyperconnectivity between the amygdala and, ventri and the ventral prefrontal cortex, right? Um, so that's why breathing really interests me for these specific sets, uh, set of patients, right? Um, you know, could changing your breathing pattern potentially decrease some of that increased connectivity in the amygdala? Um, it, that's certainly a possibility. Yeah. Um, but there are, there are a variety of ways which you can take advantage of breathing that may act in positive ways to treat various um, disorders of brain function. Like, at, like mood disorders, anxiety-related yeah. disorders, depression. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the things which is um, uh, other people are uh, primarily responsible for, in fact, I'm not responsible for it at all, is intermittent hypoxia. Mm -hmm. So this work is now being carried on mostly by my pal Gordon Mitchell at the University of Florida. But it's a re it follows from a very interesting observation made in the 60s. So if I give you uh, gas to breathe that is low in oxygen, that's a, we call it a hypoxic gas mixture, your breathing will go up, and then when I give you normal room air, it'll just come down. So mm -hmm. suppose I give you five minutes of hypoxia, your breathing goes up, and then I give you room air, it comes back down. If instead I give you two or three minutes of hypoxia, two or three minutes of normal air, two or three minutes of hypoxia, two or three minutes of normal air, and I do it three or four times. So your breathing goes up, down, up, down, up, down. When you give this kind of hypoxia, which is referred to as intermittent or episodic hypoxia, you look at the breathing pattern, the breathing pattern goes up, down, up, down, up, down, but instead of coming back to normal, it stays elevated for hours. The, heart, the respiratory rate. The respiratory rate stays elevated for hours. Right. And this is not what you see if you just have one continuous bout. Now, Gordon is... Uh, I know, and a lot of other people have shown now that intermittent hypoxia can have positive effects on spinal cord injury, uh, on cognitive function, on motor performance. It just seems like a magical elixir okay. that when you, you do it, it seems to release certain neurochemicals which have profound positive effects on the nervous system like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. It goes up, 
when you do this. And BDNF has all, does all sorts of very interesting things for the brain. And they're using this now, and they have clinical studies to treat patients who have spinal cord injury. Right. And uh, the results are very promising. I've heard of this for improving athletic performance, too. But how does it do that? Like, I, I was thinking about the different kind of mechanisms. Certainly, you know, in the long run, right, if you're doing intermittent hypoxia for an extended period of time, neuroplasticity, right, that can improve cognition, certainly. It can improve, you know, motor function in someone with a stroke, with spinal cord damage, different things like that. But specifically in performance, how would, how would that help you in performance? Has that been investigated at all? Um, only in very limited ways. And Gordon and his group is trying to move into sort of the elite performance area to yeah. see whether it has an effect. And as I mentioned on the human podcast, Gordon and I want to see if it can affect a go performance in golf, right. which would be relatively straightforward to, to measure. And my guess is that we will see an improvement. But what's what's your guess based off of? It's it's based off of certainly improvements in neurological function, but specifically with athletic performance, right? So there's a lot of factors that include being able to hit a golf ball well, which I'm not familiar with at all. Maybe you're a little bit more familiar with it, but you know, does it improve like um, muscle endurance? Does it improve stamina? I you think know? it uh, improves strength. Mm. Okay. Um, the example I like to use is ankle flexion. Ankle, I always get this backwards. Ankle extension in individuals who have had stroke that have affect the ankle movement. Mm -hmm. And if you measure their ankle extension and then give them one series of episodic hypoxia and then ask them to extend their ankle, their strength goes way up. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 I don't think it's well understood where it's happening, but I think Gordon would tell you that what's happening is you're releasing some neurotrophic factors mm -hmm. and they're having some transient effect on motor neurons. I mean, we've done some work with Gordon where we show an effect on motor neurons and other places where it can affect sort of str strength of movement, coordination, and whatnot. BDNF or these nootrophic factors you say was probably what's causing it, what's causing it, some, mo good a data. lot of these effects. Yeah. Um, so what, what's, what's the gas doing actually when you're inhaling, like what's your CO2 doing when you're inhaling that, uh, decreased percentage of oxygen? Is it staying pretty stable? Um, well, you're increasing your ventilation in response to the lower oxygen levels. Right. I think they're typically using eight to 10% when normal room air is about 21%. Okay. So your ventilation goes up. As your ventilation goes up, your CO2 levels are going down. Right. And so that the the role that the CO2 plays, I don't know where that the the data stands. Yeah. But it does mean that if you try and replicate this, for example, by breathing very slowly, so you're bringing in less oxygen, so your oxygen levels drop. If you do that by volitional change of volitional breathing, mm -hmm. your CO2 levels are going to go up. Right, it's impossible to do that. Yeah, and yeah. so it's uh, not the same thing, and we don't know the degree to which the CO2, and of course, carbon dioxide is going to affect pH. Right. If you have a lot of carbon dioxide, your blood is going to become more acidic, right. and if you have less carbon dioxide, it's going to become alkalytic, and right. all cells in the body have a favorite pH, and you change yeah. it, it's going to change the way the cells behave. I think it also causes um, release of HIF, right? Um, you probably should tell everyone what HIF is and that they gave a Nobel Prize for it, but it's hypox hypoxia-induced factor, yeah, yeah. and that is uh, released by chronic hypoxia. Right. And the, the nature of it released during episodic hypoxia or intermittent hypoxia, I don't, I don't really know, but I've okay. speculated that when you have a chronic release of these or turning on these HIF genes through chronic hypoxia, it usually is bad. Mm. But I think if you turn it on intermittently, it's good. Right. Okay, I think what may happen, and I say this with a, 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 a highly speculative, that it may actually re, uh, repair mitochondrial function. Got it. And improve mitochondrial function when you do it episodically. Right. So that's why when you train, you do HIT. Right, right. All right, HIT is stressing 
Uh, now, it's not the same thing as intermittent hypoxia because your CO2, um, your oxygen levels are not necessarily going to drop as precipitously. Right. But that intermittent, uh, the high intensity interval training stresses your system episodically. Right. And that has a much different effect than if you do it over just one extended period. Got it. I mean, it's pretty miraculous yeah. what it has, you know, been demonstrated to do. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I think a great example as to how changing your respiratory pattern can just enhance, like you said, cognition and potentially your, your you know, your physical activity and your performance. Do you incorporate HIT into your exercise regimen? I do. What not, do you do? Not, not as often as I probably should. What do you do? Um... So I do I do boxing I do the assault bike. Um, do you know what the assault bike is? It's like a peloton. I mean, it's it's uh, kind of like a peloton, but you're also yeah, right. you know moving moving sure. your hands and different things like that. And um, I just do like circuit work, so I'll do a lot of burpees. Yeah, you know. but you'll do a, a intense interval rest, intense interval rest. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it'll be a circuit where, like you said, it'll be whatever circuit followed by rest, and then. You know the next circuit and so on. So what I I like to incorporate are Tabata intervals. Yeah, because they're super intense but relatively short, and I find when I travel, which has not been the case in the past two years, but when I used to travel a lot and didn't have much time when I was traveling, I would do one or two Tabata intervals, which are classically only four minutes long, right. and I feel tremendous uh, benefit from it. Yeah. Uh, well out of proportion to the time spent. 